Mr. First's actions were not accidental but intentional. This was not a mistake. He knew his resource would not qualify for taxpayer monies without manipulating their experience. Does Mr. Fur think that the Prime Minister or the Liberal Cabinet Minister should be at the bar answering questions today instead of himself, or is he willing to go to jail for them? The Honourable, sorry, uh, Mr. Firth, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I speak to my counsel, please? This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. Colleagues, the chair would like to make a brief statement in regard to the historic moment that is about to take place. Indeed, the last time an individual was summoned to the bar of the House to answer questions dates back to 1913, well over a century ago. Specified in the House order is as follows. First, questions and answers shall be addressed through the Speaker. Second, 10 minutes will be allocated to each recognized party for the first and second rounds in the following order. Liberal Party, Conservative Party, Bloc Québécois, and New Democratic Party. At arms to admit Mr. Firth at the bar of the House. I wish to remind honourable members again that all questions are to be addressed through the chair. Avant de commencer. Before we proceed, I wish to remind honourable members that all questions are to be addressed through the chair. The honourable leader of the government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could Mr. Firth inform the House as to whether he consulted with a medical professional prior to his appearance today regarding answering questions from the House? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, yes, I did. I consulted yesterday. Monsieur, Mr. Firth, uh, Minister. Mr. Speaker, is Mr. Firth comfortable sharing what the doctor told him? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, um, yes, I am. I'm supposed to not participate in any activity that would call any undue stress uh, to myself as being diagnosed uh, with having acute mental health flare-ups, um, actively under therapy and also under medication. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, was the information about Mr. Firth's medical condition shared with the House of Commons administration? Mr. Firth. Sorry, can you answer the question again, please? Certainly, by all means. The Honourable... One moment. I just want to make sure the time. The Honourable Government House Leader. Was the information about Mr. Firth's medical condition shared with the House of Commons administration? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, we, we shared it with the clerk. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, this information is consistent with what was shared with all recognized parties yesterday individually by the law clerk and parliamentary council that Mr. Firth's health is fragile and that a doctor has provided a note recommending that Mr. Firth does, Firth does not participate in activities such as the questioning today for mental and physical health reasons. Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker, this information is consistent with what has been communicated yesterday by the Council and to all recognized party that Mr. Firth's health is fragile and that a doctor has provided a note recommending that Mr. Firth do not participate in activities such as the questioning today for mental and physical health reasons. That Mr. Firth understands that he will have to answer questions and is prepared to do so once his health allows it. I want to be crystal clear. We believe that what happened with the Arrive Can app is unacceptable. We want to assure that all unanswered questions receive answers. That, that is an important principle of this House. That is why we supported the motion that brings Mr. Firth here today. We want to get to the bottom of this issue and we want to ensure that committees are respected. 
Je tiens à être très clair. I want to be very clear. We consider that what has happened with the ArriveCan app is unacceptable. We want to ensure that all the questions that have been unanswered will get an answer. This is an important principle of the House. That is why we supported the motion that has brought Mr. Firth here today. We want to get to the bottom of the situation, and we want to ensure that the committees are respected. All recognized parties were in individually informed of options to delay the questioning component of today's proceedings until Mr. Firth has been medically cleared to participate, and only the Conservatives refused. On this side of the House, we do not believe that it is appropriate to question Mr. Firth if he is not medically able to participate. We want this to be done in a way that respects the dignity of Parliament, and forcing someone against medical advice to do something that a doctor believes could harm their treatment and recovery is indeed beneath the dignity of this place. We want this to happen with respect for dignity of Parliament and forcing somebody against their doctor's advice to do something that, according to the doctor, could uh, undermine their treatment and their healing is uh, not worthy of this House. Demonstration of his character. And Canadians should pay careful attention. The Honourable Government House Leader. I'll repeat the last sentence, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition is. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Sorry, Chair, Whip, the Honourable the Honourable Member from uh, South Surrey, Government White House Rock. Leader is purposely causing disorder in this That's House. Right. You right. just asked every person here to keep their conduct calm and within the dignity of the House for these extraordinary proceedings. He is saying things that were in a medical certificate that weren't there because we had House leaders' discussion on this, and now he is using the opportunity to attack the official opposition. This is inappropriate, and it causes discord in this House, right. and it will cause disruption on a continuing basis. I ask you, Mr. Speaker, to please ask the government House Leader to conduct himself within the dignity and within the four squares of this extraordinary situation and not continue down this path. Thank you. I thank, I thank the Honourable from uh, uh, South Surrey White Rock uh, for, for, for raising this issue. Um, I see that the Honourable Member from Regina Capel is also rising on his feet for point of order. Uh, Ms. On the same point of order, I think it's very important uh, for you to understand how we got here. Uh, it is important to, to know that the witness was offered accommodations uh, that have been granted and that should there be further accommodations requested in terms of breaks or, uh, or any type of need to consult with any professional, that we have signaled our uh, absolute cooperation with that. Uh, these are very similar to the accommodations that the witness requested when it took months for him to respond to a committee invitation and further summons. These were the same accommodations that were provided when he finally did testify uh, just recently, Mr. Speaker, and that is how we arrived at where we are today. I believe the dignity of this House, the ability for parliamentarians to do their jobs on behalf of taxpayers, on behalf of the taxpayers, many of whom lost every single cent they had during the lockdown, on behalf of the thousands of Canadians who were ordered into uh, uh, quarantine because of this app. It's essentially going to sure. 
I thank the member from Regina Capella. I thank the member from uh, South Surrey, right, White Rock, for raising these points. And I would like to emphasize uh, to all members the importance of us conducting our, ourselves. Canadians are clearly watching this historic event, and they would expect us to conduct ourselves befitting to the occasion. With that in mind, I invite the Honourable uh, Government House Leader to finish his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, you have pointed out uh, in your remarks earlier just how unprecedented this is. Uh, we supported uh, this initiative, but we regret that it's come to this. And when we received the information that all parties were privy to, uh, we made what I think is the responsible decision. And I think what you've just seen across the aisle is very confirmation of what I've been saying. Thank you very much. I will take it then that we will move on to the next series of questions. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Speaker, the Arrive Can was supposed to cost taxpayers $80,000, but the NDP Liberal government rewarded consultants and insiders who got rich on taxpayer dollars for an app that nobody wanted. The app erroneously forced more than 10,000 people under house arrest. It didn't work, and the Auditor General said it cost at least $60 million. Arrive Can is now under 13 federal investigations. Two middlemen that do no IT work got rich in a corrupt system under this NDP Liberal government. Some, including the witness today, became multimillionaires. GC Strategies is a two-person company. And they claim to find people who actually do the work by using LinkedIn. Nearly $20 million for ArriveCan is what they were paid, and roughly $2,500 per hour. They've been paid $100 million since forming GC Strategies just after this Liberal Prime Minister was elected. This is eight years of this Liberal Prime Minister. The Liberal government has been ordered to collect and recoup all funds paid to ArriveCan Arrive contractors and subcontractors that did no work on the Arrive Can app. My question, Speaker, has the government asked Mr. Firth to repay the money paid to GC Strategies on Arrive Can? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, no, they have not. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. The procurement watchdog found numerous examples where GC Strategies, quote, had simply copied and pasted, end quote, information to prove the people GC Strategies found to do work on ArriveCan actually did it. Question, has the government asked GC Strategies to repay the money paid to GC Strategies for ArriveCan? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, the numbers that were provided by the Obungsman from, from Public Works uh, we found were inaccurate when we did our assessments. Uh, and secondly, we have not been asked to, p to pay any money back. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. For how many contracts did GC Strategies copy and paste the exact same information? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, we've, for, we've never copied and pasted to win any contract. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Speaker, we know from committee testimony that Mr. Firth has admitted to doing exactly that. Today, media reports that Mr. Firth's property was raided by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, what crime are they investigating? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we, that's correct. There was a search warrant, not an arrest warrant, for my property. Um, to obtain electronic goods surrounding the Butler allegations. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police have also confirmed that GC Strategies uh, and uh, ArriveCan uh, are under police investigation. Uh, has the RCMP contacted Mr. Firth about those allegations related specifically to this Prime Minister's $60 million Arrive scam? Mr. Firth. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the RCMP has only reached out to us regarding Butler. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. In the search of Mr. Firth's home, did the RCMP take only electronic devices or were there uh, documents, uh, cell phones or any other information? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, I, I wasn't at my premises when the search was being taken, so I cannot comment on that. I don't have that information. 
The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Does Mr. Firth know if the property of his partner Darren Anthony has been searched by the RCMP? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as of this morning, I have not. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. GC Strategies is two guys in a basement taking 30% commissions on multi-million dollar contracts that they had no value to, but have endorsements from senior NDP Liberal government officials. On the endorsements, question, who was the Government of Canada Chief Information Officer who offered a quote? Mr. Firth. Mr. Firth, do you need time to consult with your counsel? Yes, please. The clock is stopped. Mr. Firth? The clock is still stopped. Could you please repeat the question of the Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Island and Rideau Lakes? GC Strategies is two guys in a basement taking 30% commissions on multi-million dollar contracts that they had no value to, but have endorsements from senior NDP Liberal government officials. On Point of order to the Honourable Member from New Westminster Burnaby is rising on his feet. Yeah, th thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I would appreciate the official opposition to approach this with some dignity. There is no NDP Liberal government. So I would expect that he would ask his questions in the appropriate form, please, through you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member from uh, New Westminster Burnaby. Uh, and, and indeed, that is the uh, case. I will ask the Honourable Member if he could just reframe his question. It's a pertinent question, uh, as it is. The Honourable Member from Leeds Grenville, Thousand Island, Rideau Lakes. This company has done no work on the multi million dollar contracts that they've been given by this Liberal government, supported by the NDP. On the endorsements on their website, who was the Government of Canada Chief Information Officer who provided an endorsement? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we gave that information over, and the name was Paul Girard. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Are all of the subcontractors that GC Strategies, Strategies use as Canadian companies? Mr. Firth. Can you write it down? Mr. Speaker, um, can I get clarification? Is that period or during the Arrive Can application? The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Subcontractors used on Government of Canada contracts. Mr. Firth. Um, every company that we represent and we work with uh, for government contracts have valid Canadian security clearances. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Speaker, not an answer to the question that I asked. Does Mr. Firth have any knowledge or involvement in the reviews for the Arrive Can app on either the Apple Store or the Google Play Store being artificially amplified or paid for? Any knowledge at all? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, I, I know those services exist, but I have no knowledge whether or not they are executed. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Island and Rideau Lakes. Bring my time to the member for Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek, please. The Honourable Member from Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek, has four minutes left. Mr. Speaker, the Procurement Ombudsman found that 76% of resources named in bids on the Arrive Can contracts did no work and were switched out for other companies. He termed this the bait and switch, which is often used to sub out expensive subcontractors for cheaper ones, allowing the middlemen to take home more profit. Did Mr. Firth switch out any of his proposed resources? on the Arrive Can application contracts. Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, we were part of the 24% that didn't. Uh, every resource we proposed that were called up for task authorizations were given to the Government of Canada. The Honourable Member from Carleton Trail, Eagle Creek. Mr. Speaker, through you, has Mr. Firth ever engaged in bait and switch in any of his contracts with the Government of Canada? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, um, we're asked to replace resources all the time, depending on if there is um, 
discrepancies with their experience, whether they're not working very well or whether or not they need to move on to another project. They're, con they're contractors, so it's, we replace resources frequently under the guidance of the, the client. The Honourable Member from Eagle, uh, Eagle Trail, Carlton. Sorry, Carlson Trail, Eagle Creek, but before she continues, I would like to let you know that we've discovered a little discrepancy in the time. She'll have an additional 30 seconds. So she has three minutes left on the clock. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General found in her arrive can report that Mr. Firth sat at the table with public servants to draft the requirements for a contract worth $25 million that he was later awarded and thereby was setting the price. Through you, what are the names of those public servants? Mr. Firth. Again, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, that name was provided in the questions, and the government official's name was Diane Daly. The Honourable Member from Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That is in direct contradiction to the name that was submitted by Mr. Firth, as a direct answer to this question from me at a committee last month. Why is the answer changing today? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the question posed to me was who, do, who did I speak with in May of 2022 prior to the contract award? And that was the procurement lady, um, which was the name I gave. But subsequently, there was a question by Mr. Genius that was posed very similar to um, the honorable members. And that was who was I engaged with at CBSA when discussing suggestions, and that was Diane Daly. The Honourable Member from Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General also found that the CBSA advised KPMG, a multinational consulting firm, that they would be a subcontractor under his two-person middleman company. At committee, the Deputy Auditor General confirmed this would allow Mr. Firth and GC Strategies to take an additional 20 per cent cut of the contract, despite not even doing the work to get them as a subcontractor. How many times have public servants provided him with subcontractors? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, do not, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it is common for once you have an existing contract in place, for a client to engage uh, your services to help bring on um, a subject matter expert that they wouldn't otherwise have access to, or typically because contracting takes quite a long time, to actually bring them in if it's a time-sensitive deliverable. The Honourable Member from Carlton Trail Eagle Creek has 30 seconds left. Mr. Speaker, I will take that to, be, to mean that the public servants have provided him with subcontractors many times. Thank you. Mr. Firth. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm not being elusive. I, I do not know the answer to that question. Thank the Honourable Member. The Honourable Member for Beauport-Limoilou. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to start these questions by touching once again upon some parts of my speech last week. Unfortunately, we are facing a historic situation caused by various problems. For example, the inconsistency of some information that we received, some information that was inconsistent within itself and also with information received from other sources. In addition, it has taken a great deal of time to receive written responses and requested documents. In some cases, the delay was up to 18 months. That said, I would add that the answers were received, although only after a great deal of delay and insistence. But nonetheless, they were in the end received, these answers. As I was saying, my questions today aim to understand processes, to understand gaps within the public service and its workings and procedures. I am not a court and I have no intention of being one. I do not want this to turn into a court of popular opinion. I would invite people to focus on our role, 
finding the flaws in the system, in the organization, in processes, all of this in order to then fix the problems. I would add that, crucially, these flaws are nothing new. Many processes were implemented many years ago by the minister at the time, the conservative minister, Ms. Ambrose. My first question. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know what skills and training were required in order to become a talent recruiter. I will ensure that Mr. Firth has heard the interpretation, and that will not take away from the Honourable Member's time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I believe I understood the question. Um, there's a series of things. There's, there's building a network that can be um, just a few years of experience, um, working with clients, working with um, resources, understanding their skill sets, understanding their availability, understanding what their per diems are. Um, it's a lot of things that have to be put into place to understand if somebody is perfect for a role. And again, are they the, are they the right experience? Are they the right skill set? Um, and then on top of that as well, it's understanding how they respond to RFPs. Uh, we're a small shop. I mean, I don't think that's a uh, you know, a surprise to anybody here. Um, so my, myself and my business partner, we had to understand how to look for RFPs on buy and sell, how to respond to them, how to recruit for them, and then how to fulfill our obligations once the contracts be awarded. And then invoicing, timesheets, everything that goes from a, a 360 desk. The Honourable Member for Bhopal Limalu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's hard to make a name for yourself within a giant government apparatus. So I'd like to know, Mr. Speaker, how the Witnesses Company became a benchmark for government talent recruitment. Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I understand the question. I'm not sure we recognize as a benchmark. Um, we were uh, in, a, in a good position to, re to respond and help with the uh, arrive can application with having resources already on the ground, already having them CBSA security cleared, which in itself takes a long time. Um, but that's not typical. It, it, was, it was at that point we were, we were, I believe we beat out competition from two to three other um, firms. We also, you heard in testimony recently from AWS, Microsoft and BDO that they didn't have the capacity to build the app. So, uh, Although I understand it, it may look like we're the benchmark, we, we are not recognized as the benchmark with the federal government. Then I have deputy the Bhopal. The Honorable Member. Mr. Speaker, going back to well before Arrive Can, at the very beginning of GC strategies, as a recognized business by the government of Canada, how did things take place? How was the company able to make its mark? Um, Mr. Speaker, um, for actually for the first two years uh, GC Strategies was in business, we actually were building corporate requirements. We were um, trying to get onto supply arrangements like TBIPs and SBIPs and ProServe and all the mechanisms to go after business. I mean, granted, they were bluebirds, which is basically means you had no idea these things were hitting the street. And then shortly after winning the first two or three, you then start getting... Um, corporate requirements, people start identifying you as being, um, you know, good at one thing, good or the other, and then at that point you start building credibility and so forth. Then I have deputy to... The Honourable Member for Beauport Limoilou. And I would just state that she has four minutes and 45 seconds left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So if I'm understanding correctly, the first few contracts received by the witness were received before fully understanding what would happen. If I remember correctly, these were in 2015. So despite the fact that the witness did not know entirely what the processes were, the, he still received contracts. I'd like to better understand this, Mr. Speaker. Earth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry. I, I understood what the process was for responding to RFPs. Um, but for the first two years, we were working um, in building our credibility through um, 
uh, other companies through like being asked to, from other subs for working with private sector and at that point we we built the confidence in our network and understanding how many resources we had access to with specific skill sets that we felt comfortable going after the the RFPs that were being put out by the federal government the honorable member for Beauport Libonou Mr Speaker I'd like to know if the witness thinks that government officials, especially with Arif Khan, abided by the rules, procedures, and policies connected with their strategic privileged position within the state apparatus and the awarding of contracts from which he profited. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I please have that question repeated? I'm going to stop the clock. Madam... Madame la députée de Beauport. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Libonou. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to know if the witness believes that government officials abided by the rules, procedures, and policies connected with their strategic privileged position within uh, the government in awarding contracts to GC strategies. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, without sounding elusive, and that's not why I'm here at all, I, I don't have the answer. I cannot comment on that. Um, I'm not privy to every meeting that happens and every conversation that happens. Then I have Deputy de Beauport. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the witness does not understand the rules of the public service, but the officials with whom he was in contact, did any of them say that they could not do certain things because, as officials, this did not um, abide by the rules? Uh, Mr. Speaker, no, they did not. The Honourable Member for beauport Libreau, Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General mentioned that members of GC Strategies drew up the criteria for contracts for the contract that they themselves won. I'd like to ask the witness if he believes that a business that draws up criteria should not withdraw from the call for tenders. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um Previous testimony that came from Amazon and Microsoft uh, last week, I believe, um, believe it is common practice to offer suggestions because typically clients aren't always um, best informed when it comes to writing RFPs or putting requirements together. Um, whether it's cloud computing for Amazon or Microsoft, um, it is common for uh, government officials or um, technical resources to ask specific suggestions, understanding what uh, skill sets and what um, technologies that they have to be privy with to um, be working on application or, or working on projects. Let I have the, the Honourable Member for beauport du Poilou has 60 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From what I understand from these answers to my last questions, it seems to me that the public service at the present time feels obliged to find certain specialized consultants because it is not able to determine the criteria for its own needs. So there seems to be a lack of specialization, a lack of specialists, a lack of training. But I would add that it is not logical for a company that has worked at drawing up criteria should be able to bid for a contract with those criteria. This is something that government officials should carry out. And this is something that any businesses that want to uh, uh, bid for a contract should avoid. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for beauport Limonou for her questions. To the Honourable Member from Skina Bulkley Valley, who has 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, too, am struck by the historic nature of this moment 
and keenly aware of our responsibility, a sacred responsibility, to not only seek answers on behalf of Canadians, but to ensure that we are not doing undue harm to the individual who's here before us, and that we're conducting ourselves in a way that upholds the integrity, the dignity, and the credibility of this place that lies at the heart of our democracy. And I'll certainly try, uh, Mr. Speaker, to uphold those values in my questioning. Mm -hmm. We're here because of the serious allegations and revelations surrounding the procurement and the execution of the ArriveCan app, a piece of technology that incorrectly uh, required thousands of Canadians to quarantine, a piece of technology that cost some $60 million, and a piece of technology that was procured in a way that both the Auditor General and the Procurement Ombudsman have found was highly irregular and likely connected to misconduct on the part of the government officials who were responsible. There are two main questions of substance that I believe we, are we were seeking answers to today. Um, the first uh, dealt with uh, Mr. Firth's misleading of the committee when it came to the question of whether he had met uh, with government officials outside of work. And the first time that that question was raised at committee, Mr. Firth uh, replied in the negative, that he had not met with officials outside of work, and then later provided uh, documentation that showed he had met with three officials at some half a dozen Ottawa restaurants and breweries. Uh, my first question, Mr. Speaker, through to Mr. Firth, is why he chose to mislead the committee in the first instance. Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm, again, I'm, I'm fully endorsing the, uh, the embolishment and understanding that there was questions that may have not been answered correctly and understanding that uh, some of them may have been obtuse, and that's why I'm here today. And we'll be answering all questions, like I have been since the last 45 minutes, uh, honestly and to the best of my knowledge. The Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, the, the question as originally asked at committee was a simple yes or no question. Had the individual met with government officials outside of work? And Mr. Firth replied that no, he had not. My question, which was not provided with an answer, was why he chose in that moment to mislead the committee. Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, um, at that time, I didn't know how many, um, so rather than give a fake answer, I didn't know exactly how many people I'd met with. I've been doing this for 16 years. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, the question was not how many government officials or how many times. The question was a yes or no question. Had Mr. Firth met with government officials outside of work? Why did he refuse to answer that question? Why did he answer that question? Sorry, Mr. Speaker. Why did he mislead the, the committee by answering that question in the negative? Why? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at that time, I thought I did answer it correctly. The Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. I have a very difficult time accepting that answer and believing that answer to be the truth. The other uh, question of substance that I believe we, are, we're, we were here to seek an answer to is which government official, Mr. Firth, discussed the criteria for a contract that he was eventually awarded. And I believe uh, he's provided that name as being Diane Daly. Uh, can Mr. Firth confirm that that is indeed the government official with whom he discussed the contract criteria? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, I can confirm that. The Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. I, Mr. Speaker, I think for Canadians watching, this is really the most troubling of the allegations, that Mr. Firth, on behalf of his company, was involved in setting the rules and the criteria for a contract, a multi-million dollar contract, that strangely enough, his firm was eventually awarded. To most Canadians, this would look like, and I, I, I won't exaggerate, it would look like a rigged system that is designed to benefit Ottawa insiders and make it more difficult for entrepreneurs and small businesses in this country to do work for the government. Does Mr. Firth not agree? 
Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the RFP, the contract that's in question, had over 220 requirements involved in there. Um, we offered up three suggestions, what still PSPC deemed 40 qualified vendors could respond to, and of which 10 showed interest. So I, I, I don't see that as overly restrictive. The Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, both the Auditor General and the Procurement Ombudsman found that the criteria for that contract were set in such a restrictive way that only GC strategies could have been selected as the successful bidder. Does Mr. Firth not agree that that process is profoundly unfair? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I kind of find the Ombudsman's comments to be somewhat subjective after the fact. Um, there, I cannot comment for why the other 39 people did not respond. People are busy. They're sometimes under the bandwidth. But, and also for the Auditor General to understand um, that we would be the only people that could respond to this. There are 635 other vendors out there with corporate requirements, and there's probably 10,000, 12,000 resources out there with technical requirements. Unless they're familiar with all of those, it's hard again to assume that uh, we were the only people qualified to win this. The Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are deeply troubled by the allegations and revelations surrounding the ArriveCan app. Could Mr. Firth, in his own words, describe what those concerns are precisely? Mr. Firth. Um, actually, no, I, I don't think I can, Mr. Speaker, being honest. I don't, I don't know the allegations and accusations around the ArriveCan app. We, we used the first three national security exemption contracts. Actually, only two of them, the first and the third, was used to build the arrived an application. So, again, not being disrespectful, I, either I don't understand the question, but I think I'm answering it honestly. The Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. At committee, Mr. Speaker, when Mr. Firth was asked about which government official he discussed contract criteria with, uh, he refused to answer citing the fact that the RCMP were now involved at some level in looking into the circumstances surrounding the ArriveCan app. And yet, uh, the rules of Parliament and the, and the laws of Canada uh, do not accept that as a valid reason uh, to refuse to answer a question of Parliament. Does Mr. Firth uh, accept the fact that the rules required him at the time to provide a full answer to our questions at committee? Mr. Firth? Uh, Mr. Speaker, as a result of my embolishment and understanding that I do now. The Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, uh, in an in internal investigation report by the company Botler AI, there is a characterization of uh, communication with Mr. Firth in which he is discussing the exorbitant commissions charged by his company for the work done by subcontractors. And in those communications, um, he is alleged to have said that it, quote, sucks for Canada, unquote. Does Mr. Firth recall making those comments? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, I have not seen any of that content. I, I cannot recall saying that at all. The Honourable Member from Skeen. For only the second time in our country's history, uh, given the grave concerns of Canadians, um, I wonder if there's anything that he would have done differently in his initial com committee appearances to avoid uh, the situation he now finds himself in. Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, absolutely. I would, uh, would have answered the questions more concisely, um, taken more time in giving the questions, sorry, the answers, and putting all written information uh, back to the committee faster. A very brief question to the, minute, for the, to the me Honourable Member from Skeena Bulkley Valley. Speaker, earlier Mr. Firth said that no one has asked him to pay back the commission that he earned. I would ask uh, that given that the Auditor General found the government overpaid for the ArriveCan app, given that the app itself didn't work and sent thousands to quarantine incorrectly, given um, that the Auditor General has called the record-keeping record around those contracts some of the worst that she has ever seen, given that 76 percent of the subcontractors sub did zero or little work, and given that GC Strategies bills itself as a recruitment firm but doesn't recruit, given all of that and the fact that Mr. Firth 
took $2.5 million in commission for very little work. Will he give that money back? Mr. Firth, a very brief answer, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we were, again, we were the 24 per cent, we were not the 76 per cent, and we did recruit over 50 people for, to work on the Arrive Can application, over 100 people in totality at CBSA. And the answer is we, we, we did as we were told. We invoiced monthly. At any time, we could have been stopped. Uh, this wasn't we were given $20 million and then walked away and built an app. This was not our app. We were paid to recruit and find resources who built the app within 20 days and did subsequent new releases for 18 months and on time and on budget. This concludes the first round of questioning. Mr. Firth, would you like a pause before the House proceeds to the next round? Mr. Speaker, yes, please. We'll now proceed to the second round of questions. Each recognized party will have 10 minutes. We'll have 10 minutes. I wish to remind honorable members that all questions are to be addressed through the chair. I wish to remind honorable members that all questions are to be addressed through the chair. The honorable leader of the government. We will move on to the honorable member for Megantic Clérab. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know first from the witness, what are the Butler allegations that led to the search of the residence by the RCMP? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of the allegations. There, there were six points on the, on the search warrant, and I think they weren't very specific to any specific allegation. Um, but from previous testimonies, I'm understanding that it was uh, um, fraudulent billing and resume fraud. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lérab. Monsieur le Président, le témoin Firth est ici à la suite du scandale libéral de l'application révocable du Premier ministre, une application qui devait coûter 80 000 qui en a coûté 60 millions. Est-ce que le gouvernement libéral, qui a versé des dizaines de millions de dollars pour du travail qui n'a pas été fait, vous a contacté? Pay. The Honourable Member for... is rising on a point of order. There is no interpretation into English. The, the member's uh, question. May I ask uh, colleagues, was there English uh, translation for the first question? For, but not for the second. All right. Could anyone tell me whether the system is working now? I would ask the member for Megantic Clérable to begin his second question again. Thank you. Witness Firth is here following the Liberal Prime Minister's Arrive Can scandal, an app that was supposed to cost $80,000. It ended up costing $60 million. Did the Liberal government, which was cheated out of tens of millions of dollars for work that wasn't done, ask you to repay it or com contact you about how to do it? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, no, no I was not contacted. The Honourable Member for Megantic Clérable. Witness Firth either refused to answer questions or lied to the Parliamentary Committee after we learned that the Prime Minister's government made him a multimillionaire at the expense of taxpayers. Can the witness confirm that he never lied in the Parliamentary Committee? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, again, acknowledging the fact that I'm being admonished, right, making history right now, I, I think I've acknowledged the fact I made mistakes in, in previous committees. The Honourable Member for Megantic Clérable. Mr. Speaker, can Mr. Firth tell us when he lied exactly? Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't have the exact information. Uh, again, I'm not being elusive. I just can't allude to which questions and what time and which month. The Honourable Member for Megantic Clérable. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the witness lied on a number of occasions in committee, and that is why we are here today to try to discover the truth. Did, can Mr. Firth confirm that he avoided naming his sources within the Liberal government to protect his uh, business model, which results from the Liberal government's lax approach to procurement? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, no, I didn't. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lérab. 
Can Mr. Firth confirm that the three quotes on the GC Strategies website were anonymous at the request of the authors of those quotes? Mr. Firth? Um, I can confirm that was requested. The Honourable Member for Megonti Clérab. Did these individuals derive any benefit from allowing GC Strategies to use their comments anonymously? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, no, they did not. The Honourable Member for Megonti Clérable, I apologize for the delay, but my microphone was not turned on, so I didn't hear the answer. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, I'll be sharing my time with the Member for Calgary Midnapur. Member from Calgary Midnapur. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Firth just admitted that the RCMP raided his house relative to Bottler AI. When Mr. Firth introduced Bottler AI to his consultant colleague, Mr. Von Brennan, he had them email Mr. Jeremy Broadhurst, the former Chief of Staff for the Minister of Finance and the current Liberal campaign chair. Did Mr. Brennan regularly set up Mr. Firth's contacts with elected officials, ministers and their Chiefs of Staff? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm... Um that's news to me. I've never engaged Vaughan Brennan to get any meetings with senior government officials. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapur. Mr. Firth aware that Mr. Brennan's wife works for Procurement Canada? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was as of the third testimony when that was brought to light, but until then I was not aware of it. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapur. What benefits did Mr. Von Brennan provide Mr. Firth for the further, that furthered their professional relationship? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Von Brennan never provided anything outside of just the work we would give him on a per diem time and material basis for a government department. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapur. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Firth submitted that he was meeting with government officials outside of government offices. Where did Mr. Firth meet Paul Girard, former CIO of TBS? Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I have met Paul Girard at uh, Starbucks on 99 Metcalf. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapur. Did Mr. Firth discuss at this meeting? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with Mr. Girard's position, and I had two contracts uh, within his directorate, it was just understanding if um, how the contracts were going, um, thanking me, thinking the resources were performing well, understanding if there are any issues, and I think just general chief information officer duties. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapur. Where did Mr. Firth meet Monsieur Philippe Johnston, former CIO at NRC? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, could Baton Rouge, that was underneath where his department was, or it could have been a coffee shop? The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapur. What did Mr. Firth discuss at this meeting? Mr. Firth. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, at that time, it was very similar to Mr. Girard. We had contracts within uh, Mr. Johnson's uh, de uh, department, and I think it was just a health check on the contracts, making sure that uh, uh, my resources were performing. If they weren't, then they'd just give me, they'd let me know this, and we'd replace them. Thirty seconds left to the honourable member from Calgary, Midnapur. Mr. Firth has made connections and met with public servants for over a decade, whining and dining them for contracts. Officials became comfortable with the system. Officials allowed Mr. Firth to charge millions because they weren't willing to follow the rules and used Mr. Firth as their way easily out of accountability. Through you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Firth, who are you protecting in this corrupt system? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm not protecting anybody. I'm just going about my business like an IT staffing firm does. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, all my questions will be through you. Did Mr. Firth review the content of the search warrant executed on his house yesterday? Mr. Firth. Yeah, I skimmed through the six pages, yes. Ms. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. Did the search warrant specify a forgery pursuant to 366 of the Criminal Code and fraud pursuant to Section 380 of the Criminal Code of Canada? Mr. Firth. Again, Mr. Speaker, I, I'd skim through, and to answer honestly, I, I cannot give that answer accurately. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. 
Mr. Firth admitted that he altered two resumes, replacing a two-month internship with 51 months of professional experience. On another occasion, he inflated seven years of experience to 12. He claimed that this was a mistake. He didn't have consent to manipulate the resumes. Isn't that correct? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've mentioned this previously in previous testimonies, but we encourage the RCMP to investigation uh, into the Butler allegations, whether it's fraud over 5,000, um, because it, we believe it's going to exonerate us. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. He clearly didn't answer the question. I'll move on. How many other times has Mr. Firth altered materials and resumes to the government since 2015? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we, it's, it's a common practice to engage with a resource, understand, because not every, everybody's CV or resume completely aligns with requirements that are coming out. They may have the experience, but we just have to speak with them to qualify that. The Honourable Member from, the Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. I'm asking for the number, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, I don't have a number. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. Mr. Firth's actions amounted to forgery under the Criminal Code. He altered resumes to secure government contracts, thereby fleecing the Canadian taxpayer. Isn't that correct? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the allegations regarding the Butler resumes were on a contract that had already been awarded. Um, so these were task authorizations. No contract would have been decided either way by these resumes. It was one business. The Honourable Member from Brantford Brant. Mr. Firth's actions further constituted a fraud on the Government of Canada. Section 380 of the Code stipulates that everyone who by deceit, falsehood or other fraudulent means defrauds the public of any property, money or valuable security. Both offences are punishable by indictment and upon conviction he could face a maximum prison sentence of 10 to 14 years. Is he aware of that? Mr. Firth. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, we're... Um Looking forward to the investigation by the RCMP because we believe it will incinerate us. I'd like to let the Honourable Member from Brantford Brant know that he has 25 seconds left on the clock. Mr. First, actions were not accidental but intentional. This was not a mistake. He knew his resource would not qualify for taxpayer monies without manipulating their experience. Does Mr. Fur think that the Prime Minister or the Liberal Cabinet Minister should be at the bar answering questions today instead of himself, or is he willing to go to jail for them? The Honourable, sorry, uh, Mr. Firth, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I speak to my counsel, please? Mr. Firth? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm, I'm not even sure what the question is there. Yeah. Neither are we. Sure, I, I wish to inform the honourable member that his time has elapsed. The let her have the. Well, I have to. I will, the, uh, the, uh, I, the honourable. Uh, the, the honourable member, from, the honourable member from Brantford Brant, I'd like to inform him, and we will be able to show him this on the, on the record. But actually, by the time you had finished your question, you had already, already elapsed the time that you had had. I respect that, Mr. Speaker. Clearly indicated he didn't understand the question. In terms well, of fairness to Mr. Firth, he should be afforded an opportunity well, to be rephrasing the question. Perhaps slower, so well. we can understand it and respond accordingly. Point of order. Point of order. The Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. You started off today about talking about the importance of decorum, and I do not think it's appropriate for the member opposite to be challenging the Speaker when the rules, as you expressed them, were very clear. The time has expired. That means we move on to the next person, and he should not be challenging this chair. I appreciate uh, the intervention from the Deputy uh, Par the Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. I'm going to take a moment uh, to consult on this matter. The Chair is going to permit uh, the Honourable Member from Brantford Grant to please put a question within 10 seconds uh, so that the Honourable, uh, so that the witness, Mr. Firth, can answer the question. 
Does Mr. Furr think that he should be solely responsible for this scam, or should the Prime Minister, the Liberal Cabinet Ministers, and certain members of the Liberal backbench should be at this bar facing consequences, Here legal consequences? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm sorry, again, I don't want to be elusive. I, I can't comment on this. That's kind of speculative, and I, I'm not sure what I can do here. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. Mr. Speaker, far be it for me to defend the Canadian Parliament. After all, it's an, inst an institution that I would like Quebec to no longer owe anything to one day. But I do want to defend the principles that are embodied by this parliament respecting democratic institutions and the parliamentary democracy that Quebec is part of. A few weeks ago, the Auditor General of General's office tabled a report on the management of the Arrive Can app. According to her, the Auditor General, the management of this application was the worst she had seen in her career. It was supposed to cost $80,000 and in the end cost $60 million. Also in the AG report, we learned that a two-person business whose owner is here now pocketed more than $19 million for this project. That company, GC Strategies. We also learned that this Arrive Can file was only the tip of the iceberg. Recently, it was revealed that GC Strategies and its forerunner, Corridor Systems Consulting, received nearly $108 million in contracts from 2011. And manual searches found more additional contracts. We also learned in the AG report and others that there were various other things like whiskey tastings, dinners, golf tournaments, and others. These social occasions involved both Christian Firth, the witness here today, and government officials. So it's perfectly healthy in a self-respecting democracy that parliamentarians who are responsible for ensuring that the state apparatus works well it's completely, it's completely appropriate that they closely examine what happened to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And that is why the owners of GC Strategies were asked to appear at committee on multiple occasions. Mr. Crinch, Christian Firth refused to answer numerous questions and compromised parliamentarians' work by not sending requested documents within a reasonable time. He even lied at committee, and he refused to send a list of public servants that he did business with. He did send it just now, but it is not complete, according to what we heard at committee. It's very clear that this points to major problems at the level of procurement. For nearly 50 years, it's been so hard to pre-select companies for the government to do business with that SMEs that don't actually offer any service of their own end up receiving commissions to indirectly put the government into contact with the companies that will actually do the work. It's completely absurd, Mr. Speaker. And here we have a person who profited from a broken system and pushed that to an extreme. I'll give an example. When the CBSA identified KPMG as being a business that it wanted to work with and that was already in the list of pre-approved businesses, CBSA contacted KPMG and the work was going to be done, but then a CBD, CBSA public servant called KPMG to announce that there would be an intermediary in the contract, which was GC Strategies. And we learned that Mr. Christian Firth met with KPMG in that file, and that's exactly the problem, Mr. Speaker. It's that Christian Firth and his two-person business did not deliver even the service that they said they would, a headhunting service, a recruitment service, that they did nothing and that nonetheless they pocketed $84,000. So my question for Mr. Firth, does he think that taxpayers got value for their money for this $84,000? Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you for the question. Um, the reality is this is common practice for uh, people with existing contracts. They get subcontractors to come through their company because typically uh, the time to procure directly even if you're an existing one of the 635 vendors that could do work with the government, it takes too long. So again, I was not aware of the file and what the urgency was and the deliverables, um, but I did know that there was uh, timelines were very tight. So my assumption, again, this is being speculative, was they were leveraging the, the contract that I had because it needed to be done quickly. 
that I have deputy the The Honorable Member for Taban. Mr. Speaker, based on what we heard at committee, public servants were doing their very best. They're doing best for contracts to be granted quickly, which is why in certain cases there were uncompetitive RFPs. So once again, we're hearing contradictory things. According to Mr. Firth, why, why didn't this public servant just pick up the phone, call KPMG? Why did they instead tell KPMG that there would be an intermediary who would get $84,000 for doing nothing? Why does he think the public servant did that? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, again, not being elusive, I, I can't comment on why somebody picked up the phone in a government organization and made a call. Let I have deputy to tell Bun. The Honorable Member for Tell Bun. Mr. Speaker, does Mr. Firth have an, a number in mind for the value of gifts in kind or money that was offered to public servants in exchange for contracts? Uh, Mr. Speaker, yeah, that, that number is zero. Let I have deputy to tell Bun. The Honorable Member for Tell Bun. Mr. Speaker, to sum up, Mr. Firth never paid for a coffee, a restaurant meal, a golf game, whiskey tasting, despite everything we heard at committee? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, um, yeah, I've admitted I would go out and I would invite peop uh, government employees to uh, lunches, to coffee, but understanding that if they were to show up, they'd already asked, they're gone through the regular chain of command and have already asked permission to, to accept that. Then I have deputy to tell Bud. The Honourable Member for Talbot. Well, this is a good example of, contradiction, of a contradiction. We went from saying that the amount is zero to admitting that indeed there were dinners, golf games, whiskey tastings with dozens of federal public servants and so on. So I will repeat my question then. What's the number there, whether it be in kind or in money? What is the amount given to federal public servants? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the first question was specific to what was given to receive contracts by government employees. So that's why I said it was zero. Um, once the contracts had been awarded through regular procurement practices, uh, they became a client, and we would have frequent meetings to check on the, the health of the project, whether that was over lunch or whether that was during coffee. Let I have deputy de Terrebonne. Pourquoi faisait the honourable member? But why do that if it was not to obtain federal contracts? Mr. Firth. Because I'm looking for a Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm looking for a health check on how my resources are performing and whether or not also I need to replace any if they're not. Let I have deputy de Terrebonne. The honourable member. These people with whom the witness had coffee with or whiskey tastings, had he pre-identified them as people who could grant him contracts, or were they simply people that he was that he just met in the street? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they were um, clients who we engaged with once we'd won the contracts. Mr. Speaker, that is clearly offering a service paid in kind to obtain a contract. That's the very definition. Next question. Mr. Firth justified his hourly rate, $2,600 per hour, by the fact that he didn't just work 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. Does he believe that Canadians and Quebecers got, got bang for their buck for that amount of money that they paid for many hours of Mr. Firth's time. To Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the hours that we're quoting were specific to ArriveCan. We had 22 other departments and other contracts we were working on at that time. And I'd like to also remind that uh, we, were, we were picked, we, we didn't solicit, and we provided uh, services to over 50, 50 resources were in there and delivered on 170 releases on the application. Let I have deputy de Terrebonne, qui a une minute. The Honourable Member, 90 seconds. Mr. Firth and Mr. Anthony met at Veritac, which was accused of colluding on contracts in 2009 at the time Mr. Firth was working there. The judge who looked at the matter stated that all employees should, received, uh, should receive anti-collusion training. Did Ms. Does Mr. Firth remember anything from that training? Uh, I will just interrupt this for a moment. No. Mr. Firth. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, in 2009 at Veritech, I was a recruiter. I was not involved in the sales cycle whatsoever, so I don't think I had training in 2009. The Honourable Member for Talbon. Well, even a recruiter is considered an employee of a business, so that's a real shame. What we see here today, Mr. Speaker, is that there's a real problem in procurement, and there's been a loss of control when it comes to gifts accepted by public servants, as we've seen today. So I think that CPSA, which was one of the main government agencies to offer contracts to C GC strategies, should be placed under examination because Quebecers and Canadians need to get back the, the money that was wasted on this business and others. Mr. Mr. Firth, if you would like to answer, you have about 13 seconds. Um, Mr. Speaker, can we... I know we can stop the clock. Can I please have the question again? Please, I, I wasn't getting through my headphones very well. I will ask the member to repeat. Mr. Speaker, does, does the witness agree that if public service didn't respect internal procedures, they should either lose their jobs or, if this is a generalized problem at the CBSA, that that agency should be placed under monitoring? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I believe if there's any wrongdoing that's been found, there should be repercussions. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Griesbaud now has the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think Canadians across the country, members of Parliament, are disappointed, not just in the dramatic failure of the procurement system in our country to address the real issues of value for money, but it sheds light on what is a terrible instance of reporting, missing information lost invoicing, and we don't even know the total amount today. Mr. Speaker, this is a serious and grave matter facing our country, and one that stems back now decades. We heard that through testimony at the Public Accounts Committee, to which I'm a member, several times from other contractors that would speak to us about the tremendous vulnerability that, is exist that exists in Canada's procurement system, but also exists in the lack of investment in our public sector. According to the Globe and Mail, for instance, since 2017, GC Strategies has received $46 million in federal funding. The flow of tax dollars to GC has increased steadily each year, growing from $32.6 million in the 2016-2017 fiscal year to $80.3 million in the 21-22 fiscal year. Now, according to the Auditor General, GC Strategies, Arrive Can, GC Strategies Arrive Can app cost Canadians almost $60 million. And the total is still undetermined due to that very lack of documentation and paper trail, a serious and grave error in and of itself. On top of that, we notice that this vulnerability of our public service and procurement creates a system where insiders are able to profit in an extreme amounts because of a system that doesn't have the proper accountability, that doesn't have the proper follow-through, and albeit, in this particular instance, lack of proper procurement. Canadians are rightly disappointed. Not only that, they're angry with the very real fact that Canadians wake up every single day, they go to work, they pay their taxes, and they do everything right. And then to be told that the tax dollar that they work so hard for isn't going to closing the gaps in social or economic outcomes or material benefit for Canadians, but is going towards the dramatic outsourcing of jobs that Canadians and our public service could do. I recognize that not all IT services, of course, can be dealt with here at the House of Commons or in our public service, but that a great deal of it could. So my question is now to, through you, Mr. Speaker, to Mr. Firth. When did Mr. Firth first start doing contracts and business with the Government of Canada? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my first contract would clearly mean 2011. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesbach. What are the names of your various companies that have contracted or subcontracted with the Government of Canada since that time? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can't probably remember them all, but I'll do as best I can. So, 
KP. Your company. Sorry, can I ask? Sorry, can I get qualification on that question, please? We'll stop the clock. Do you need to consult with your? Or, I'm not certain what you're asking me, Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, um, I just want qualifications. Are you speaking about my companies or companies that we do sub work through? The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesbach. Mr. Speaker, I'm inquiring as to the names of the companies that he is the owner or co-owner of since the time of 2011 that has been doing business with the Government of Canada. Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, the only IT staffing firm I've had is GC Strategies as an owner. We were not part of Codale. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesbach. Does Mr. Firth believe the work that his company has done, GC Strategies, in relation to Arrive Can was good money for Canadian dollar? Mr. Firth? Uh, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I believe the team we put forward, and again, as, as attested to by AWS, Microsoft, and BDO, were the only ones at that point that had capacity to build this application. Um, so I'd say yes. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesbach. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Firth in the past has spoken about his uh, worries or concerns or even at times perceived rejection of the Auditor General's report, in particular to this fact as well in regards to dollar or value for money. What does Mr. Firth have to say in relation to the Auditor General's report on value for money? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not questioning the report. I'm just, again, it's the inputs that were given to the report. Um, there's a big delta between the 19.1 million that we, uh, that the AEG's report claimed that we used to build the application versus the 11. But because of the financial system and the tagging for other projects associated, because these contracts were pandemic response contracts, they weren't specific to arrive can app. I can understand why there's a discrepancy. Member for Edmonton, Griesbach. Now, Mr. Speaker, Canadians know that when our public service does the job that they're doing it knowing that the most important piece to that is the outcome for Canadians, making sure that the service is truly up to the standard that Canadians expect. When we outsource that work, when we take that job away from the public sector, when we take it away from those who work for the better good of our country, it comes with a price, it comes with commission, and it comes with profit by the private sector in this particular instance. So how much money did Mr. Firth take home from these contracts? Firth? Um, Mr. Speaker, again, not being elusive, I don't have that exact number in front of me. Sorry. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesbach. Mr. Speaker, it's difficult to not be able to supply such a number when, as a matter of fact, the company would have been the responsible for not only issuing invoices, or issuing the amount owed to them, but it's also up to an owner of a company to administer and to have paperwork for their employees, including themselves if they're paid. Does Mr. Firth suggest that he hasn't paid himself or hasn't kept track of payments to himself? And if not, how can we in this chamber are able to get this information and what he supplied in writing later? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sorry. I was the I can answer that question. I just don't have the answer right in front of me right now. Like I was, I was not given a set of questions that will be coming at me in the last next hour and twenty minutes. Sorry, Mr. Firth. There was a second part to that question. Can I ask the honourable member to repeat it, please? Clock has stopped. The honourable member from Edmonton, Griesbach. Would Mr. Firth supply the amount he took home from government contracts? Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I think that information has been provided to the committee. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesbach. You and, your, you and your partner, or Mr. Firth and his partner, Mr. Anthony, have both made accusations that the other general's report is false and that she is lying. He made clarity to my question in relation to some of the numbers supplied. In addition to those numbers of supply, what, is, what other areas of that report would Mr. Firth contest? Mr. Firth. Um, off the top of my head, Mr. Speaker, the, the numbers one is the one that's caused the most media attention, and so that would be the one that I would be more focused on making sure that was corrected. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesbach. 
The Office of the Procurement Ombudsman says that, quote, overly restrictive mandatory solicitation criteria favored GC Strategies for a $25 million contract. GC Strategies had been involved in the development of their requirements, which were included by the CBSA in a request for proposal for a contract ultimately won by Mr. Firth. To be clear, Mr. Firth's company, GC Strategies, by evidence of the Ombudsman, participated in the recommendation set out in a request for proposal to which Mr. Firth's company applied and was awarded a contract. Does Mr. Firth understand that the Auditor General concluded in that investigation that there was no evidence to the effect that GC Strategy supplied a proposal even to get this contract? Can Mr. Firth please explain how and who from the CBSA requested information related to a contract like the one that they were recipient of, and what aspects of that proposal did Mr. Firth supply for requirement? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like just a quick clarification on the question. The, the, the Order General identified no proposal for the national security exemption ones, not, not I don't think the one that we're discussing right now. Mr. Griesbach. I'm sorry, the Ed Honourable Member from Edmonton Griesbach. In what capacity was Mr. Firth involved in developing and contributing to the CBSA requirements for the Arrive Can contract? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, previously mentioned there are 220 requirements in that RFP. There were three suggestions we put forward, understanding that they need to know the technology stack, they need to know the types of resources they would need. From that point onwards, that, that was everything. And the two, the 100 and the 220 other requirements were all public information that could be obtained through buy and sell or any other RFP that's hit the street. And on top of that as well, uh, it was PSPC that still deemed 40 qualified vendors who could re respond to this RFP. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Griesbaugh. Can Mr. Firth please explain the process, in particular the timeline of events, that enabled Mr. Firth's contribution to that RFP? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I was approached in May of 2021, I believe, uh, for suggestions and understanding what kind of requirements they would need for a, for a team to continue the work. And I believe the contract was awarded a year later, and there was no conversation in between that. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Grease Bus, 20 seconds on the clock. Does Mr. Firth believe that to be a conflict of interest? Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I do not. Uh, again, these were three suggestions of 220 that went through multiple levels, that went through multiple departments uh, before it being even awarded and evaluated. This concludes the second round of questioning. Mr. Firth, would you like a pause before the House proceeds to the next round of questions? Mr. Speaker, yes, please. The House will now proceed to the third round of questions. Each recognized party and the Green Party will have five minutes. The House will now proceed to the third round of questioning. Each recognized party and the Green Party will have five minutes each. All questions are to be addressed through the Chair. I would remind honourable members that all questions are to be directed to the Chair. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Furst said today that he was completely unaware of connections between Vaughn Brennan and senior Liberal staffer Jeremy Broadhurst. Completely unaware of connections to senior Liberals. But Mr. Furth received a text on February 1st, 2021 that was subsequently reported in the Globe and Mail that specifically described the involvement of the Deputy Prime Minister's office where Broadhurst was Chief of Staff. Does Mr. Furth want to correct his earlier response? Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I have no knowledge. I cannot remember sending that text message. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Firth received a text message on February 1st, 2021. It was reported in the Globe and Mail. That report in the Globe and Mail, along with other information, sparked subsequent hearings uh, at the Government Operations Committee. Uh, is Mr. Firth claiming he didn't read that article or the text? He skims. Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I cannot remember that text message and I can't remember that article. The Honourable Member from Fort Saskatchewan, Sher sorry, Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. A final chance to tell the truth. Will the witness tell the House about any connections and relationships between him and 
uh, Jeremy Broadhurst or that he is aware of between Vaughn Brennan and Jeremy Broadhurst. He received texts. It's in the Globe and Mail. Will he tell the truth? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I do not know of any uh, communications when I was, did not remember that text message or I haven't seen the article. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan. Mr. Firth claimed today that it is common practice for clients to request and receive suggestions about the content of RFPs from those who bid on. How many times since 2015 has GC Strategies provided these kinds of suggestions to government clients regarding RFPs that they then bid on? Mr. Firth. Again, Mr. Speaker, without being elusive here, I do not have that number. I, I don't know. The Honourable Member from Fort Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Will the witness undertake to provide a response to that question in writing to the Speaker and the Government Operations Committee within 14 days? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we were kind of spoken to previously. Do we have to provide information to the House? I'm going to uh, pause the session while I consult the Chair. Uh, to, the honorable, uh, to all honourable members, uh, the process which was set forth by the House was that uh, subsequent to this, uh, to the calling of the bar and the admonishment and responding to questions and supplementary questions, that this matter, uh, the answers uh, from the questions that are being provided by Mr. Firth would be referred to the uh, government, uh, uh, referred to, gov to the House Committee uh, for them uh, to evaluate and to make recommendations. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan rising on a point of order. The, the witness has asked if he has to provide responses. Right. I would submit to you that the whole reason he is here is because he has refused to provide responses. Here, here. This here. is why the House is taking this matter so seriously. So, uh, I, 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 what I understood Mr. Firth to say uh, to the Honourable Member was that he was asking whether or not he had to respond, uh, reply, to provide a response to the Speaker of the House. The point that I was making before in terms of the order that the House had set out, the order that the House had passed, uh, was that uh, any uh, — what testimony is brought here today will be referred to the committee. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Will the witness provide the response in writing to the question I have asked that he claims to be unable to answer? Will he provide it in writing within 14 days to the Speaker and the Committee, yes or no? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, yes, I will. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Why did the government go to GC Strategies for this sort of advice? How did GC become a favoured contractor and advisor regarding RFPs to the Government of Canada? Mr. Firth. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I got my first contract in 2011 and have done subsequently since by just uh, re responding to RFPs. Um, I haven't become, I don't think, I mean, it's flattering to be a recognised person to provide requirements and help for the federal government. Order. We're looking for members to conduct themselves in a manner that is befitting of this, of this occasion. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Uh, speaker, it's, it's very flattering indeed. Uh, according to committee testimony, Mr. Firth uh, received $2,600 per hour spent wow. working on a Rive scan. Uh, that's substantially more than the earnings of an average NHL player. Very flattering that they came to him for advice. Very flattering that he was paid so much. Does he see this as a reasonable rate of compensation for what he did? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, the in the testimony, they were quoting hours towards a Rive can. We had 22 other departments and 20 other contracts we were working at the same time. It's impossible for me to spend 250 hours on one contract when I have to service and maintain other projects with other clients. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Is the witness involved with any other companies? Mr. Firth. Sorry. 
just my my hold co that's my that uh, is the fifty percent owner of GC Strategies. The honourable member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Uh, what, what is that hold co, and does it do business with the government of Canada? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my hold co is a numbered company that was used to register the name GC Strategies. The honourable member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Does it do business with the government of Canada directly? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, it does not. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. The witness discussed the health of contracts outside the office with Paul Gerard, Treasury Board CIO. Uh, did he discuss replacing resources or increasing resources at that time? Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Speaker, I've had many conversations with Paul Gerard. I can't remember every single one of them. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, only has a brief period of time, but he's been asking very quick questions. Uh, did he discuss new contracts, and since he claims to be unable to answer that question, will he respond to it in writing as well? The Honourable... Sorry, Mr. Firth. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, I, I thought I did answer the question. I'm going to ask the Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, to rephrase the question. The question was, in meetings outside the office with Paul Gerard, did they discuss replacing resources or increasing resources? Did they discuss new contracts? And if the witness is unable to answer that question, will he provide a response in writing? Mr. Firth. Uh, I, yeah, but I, I will respond in writing. I don't have all those information and every, I don't have every conversation with Mr. Gerard catalog. Questioning by the member for La Prairie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier, the witness mentioned that he had uh, doctored two CVs that led to the attribution of the contracts. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't think I said that earlier. And I have the Honourable Member for La Prairie. I am convinced that uh, he did. I was here. I don't understand why he said that he didn't say that because earlier... The Conservative mentioned, did you doctor two CVs? He said yes, but after the contracts were uh, awarded, is, uh, did I un misunderstand? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I didn't say I doctored two resumes. I said that the business was already won. I didn't amend any resumes to win any contracts. And the contracts were for a, sorry, the, the resumes were for a task authorization that was already one business. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, he didn't say that he then amended, uh, he amended the contracts after, the CVs after. Mr. Speaker, I, I've, I've never amended a contract. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, earlier our witness said that public servants got changes after the contracts were given. Is that what he said? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, sorry, I do not understand the question. We will suspend the clock, and I will invite the member for La Prairie to ask his question once again. I'm ready. Can I go? Earlier, the member for Terrebonne asked the question, did you already pay uh, monies or get gifts in kind to public servants? And the witness said yes, but only after contracts were awarded. Is that true? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yeah, we don't give gifts and do bribes to win contracts. The, the Honourable Member for La Prairie. He said earlier that he paid for restaurants or things like this to public servants, but he said that he did after contracts were awarded. Is that true? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's correct. We would always, uh, once a contract's been awarded, you, you want to have a relationship with your client to understand if your resources are doing a good job or if they're not, and try and pivot and move as fast as possible to replace them. Uh, the fact that the invitation went out and the officials showed up, suggested that they followed the code of conduct and they had already asked permission from their superiors. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. So the for a public servant for him is the client, is that correct? Mr. Firth. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, if we're doing government business, correct. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Is it possible that when you give uh, premiums or gifts after a contract, is that before another contract, possibly? Mr. Firth. Um, Mr. Uh, I believe it would be before another contract, but that doesn't mean that it's for me. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. So, uh, inaudible for the interpreter. Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it was inaudible for the translator. We will ask Mr. We will stop the clock and ask the member to re-ask the question. If I may, Mr. Speaker, I will conclude based on what we heard today. So it's normal for border services to deal with GC strategies, to give them $19 million without having exceptional skills or that they be necessary in obtaining contracts or the disclosure of contracts. Uh, we also have to accept the fact that public servants got gifts before or after. It's not clear. We have to accept the fact that GC strategies help to draft contracts and tenders because uh, the Border Services Agency doesn't have the skills to know its own needs and uh, its own criteria when the time comes to develop a tender or request for a proposal. And this is very concerning, and we are supposed to find this normal that somebody would get uh, $84,000 million, $84, for nothing. And we're talking about this money for which nothing was done. So here we... Who is at fault here? That's the question. Perhaps it's the Canada Border Services Agency's fault, perhaps the point, tip of the iceberg, but it's not normal, Mr. Speaker. Listen. The Auditor General said that this was the worst bookkeeping she'd ever seen. This is not normal right now. The Canada Border Services Agency is working on a system to record imports, GCRA, and the Committee of the House of Commons said that there are a number of irregularities. It's of concern that this agency continues to do its work after what we've heard today, and uh, this government must, and this agency must be more responsible. It must be under uh, trusteeship. We must get the money back, M taxpayers' money that was spent for reasons that we still don't understand, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Firth, if you would like to, uh, although there might not have been a question, if there's a, if you'd like to make a comment, I'll allow you this time to do so. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Reprise de question. Resuming the questions, the Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. The Honourable Member from New Westminster, Burnaby. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, now that, uh, through you to Mr. Firth, now that you're aware of the powers of Parliament, I uh, wanted to ask through you to Mr. Firth whether he regrets not answering the questions that were asked of him, not once, not twice, but three times, at uh, the Government Operations Committee. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, absolutely. I've uh, sent that in writing to, I believe, to all members of Parliament prior to coming here uh, for apologies for, for that. The Honourable Member from Bur New Westminster, Burnaby. I would like to know if Mr. Firth met with any members of Parliament during the process for the RFP for the contract for Arrive Can, uh, or during the contract process. Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, no, I did not. The Honourable Member from New Westminster, Burnaby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to know if Mr. Firth, outside of the committees where he has been brought to uh, formally, if he has ever met or spoken with any members of Parliament from, uh, regardless of, of which, which party. Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I speak to my counsel for two seconds, please? Clock has stopped. Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, no, I have not. The Honourable Member from New Westminster, Burnaby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just to be clear, uh, Mr. Firth has not had any private conversations uh, at any point with any Member of Parliament over the period of the committee hearings. Uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about committees themselves. I'm talking about private conversations, hallway conversations, phone calls, anything of that nature. Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I have not. The Honourable Member from New Westminster, Burnaby. 
Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a scandal. When we talk about the ArriveCan app, we haven't seen this kind of scandal since the Harper regime. And we saw a scandal that cost Canadian taxpayers $400 million. At the time, we were talking about a majority Conservative government, and they refused in any way whatsoever to get the answers that Canadians were looking for. And of course, Mr. Speaker, that Conservative scandal was one for which we never got the information. And we saw then the Arrive Hand scandal, where, since this is a minority parliament, we are now getting the answers. So this is something that's extremely important, because we're talking about the parliamentary power that we have. And in a majority government, as we saw under Harper, we were not able to get the answers on the $400 million uh, the, that disappeared under the Conservatives without any transparency today. We have the possibility, however, of getting more answers, and I think that this is important. So Mr. Firth, he talked earlier about the fact that he influenced, if I understood, three elements only of the 230 requirements in those contracts. Is Mr. Firth saying that he did not influence the contract, or is he saying that he didn't influence the scandal as much as is claimed? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the answer is correct to both of those. I had no influence at all on the contract award, and I had no influence on this, the arrived can scandal. Then I have the Honourable Member for New Westminster Burnaby. Earlier, Mr. Firth spoke about the fact that he had changed the resumes were talking, of course, and this is in the committee testimony that he had. There was somebody who had uh, 13 years of experience. That was not true. And there was also another other pieces of information that were changed with regard to those individuals. I would like to ask two questions, Mr. Speaker. First, does Mr. Firth regret that these resumes were falsified, and second, reminds the fact that to date the federal government has not asked for those amounts to be repaid. We're talking about the, those amounts. So, Mr. Firth, the question to Mr. Firth is: Is he prepared to repay to the Canadian public the um, the controversial amounts in the awarding of these contracts? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Butler contract was no way related to the ArriveCan application. And, and furthermore, I made zero dollars margin on the Butler opportunity. Resuming questions, the Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. The Honourable Member from Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this historic, unprecedented occasion. I'd like to put this question through you, Mr. Speaker, to Mr. Firth. I know he will not have them with him at the moment, but will he provide to Parliament, to, through the Speaker and to the Operations Committee, the full list of all website domains that he has registered or requested to be registered in pursuit of his business? as an IT staffing firm. Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, I, yep, I can do that. The Honourable Member from Stanish Gulf Islands. Thank you. I'd like to review some of the answers you, that, the, that the witness gave earlier today. To the Honourable Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley, when asked if he would like to have had, if he thinks back on it and reflects on his answers to committee, if he wished he'd answered differently, and his answer was, he, perhaps, he wishes he could have answered more concisely. I'd like to put it to the witness, through you, Mr. Speaker, that no one has accused him of answers that were verbose. He's been accused of and found to have answered in ways that were evasive and dishonest. Would he like to amend his answer to say he wishes he had answered honestly in the first instance? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker. 
again, as a result of this embolishment, like, there's a lot of mistakes that I've made. That's why I was here. So the answer would be yes. The Honourable Member from Saanich Gulf Islands. In response to questions from the Honourable Member for Megantic Arab, he had similarly had said earlier today, I made mistakes. Is it correct to say that when the witness says, I made mistakes, he is acknowledging that he behaved in ways that, were, that amounted to a contempt of Parliament by being deliberately misleading, evasive, and dishonest. And in, I would also suggest that most Canadians would not consider these to be mistakes, but deliberate efforts to mislead Parliament. Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they, they were mistakes. Uh, I have a lot of respect for this, and this was not deliberately misleading. The Honourable Member from Sanish Gulf Islands. I'd, I'd like, Mr. Speaker, in the last few moments that we have here with the witness, to I'm trying to put myself in the position of a Canadian watching this on television and wondering, how could this happen? I think it's clear on a factual basis and respecting this place and everyone in it that there's been here, this example is the Auditor General has found, as the Ombudsman has found, an appalling failure of our procurement process that's completely unacceptable. And the, the, the individuals involved in GC strategies, particularly um, Mr. Firth and his partner, have benefited personally from what can best be described as extremely dodgy business practices. I'd like to ask on behalf of the people of Canada for, and it's, it's an obvious question, I'm not suggesting there is an answer, but I'd like to ask Mr. Firth, is he a member of any political party? Does he donate to any particular party? Has he been involved in currying favour with any party or political parties in this country? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, no, I have not. The Honourable Member from Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you. I'm pursuing an, uh, evidence that you gave to the, operation, the Government Operations Committee on October 20th. It's a very interesting skill set which you um, uh, have, which, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, which the witness has to obtain uh, these various contracts. Um, Mr. Firth said that between, quote, my business partner, Darren, and me, we have 30 years of experience dealing with IT companies, or whether dealing with independent consultants, or we have the luxury of dealing with true subject matter firms. We build a network in which we know the people. Is it the case, to ask the witness, that the, the business experience, which gained him millions of dollars in personal benefit, amount to having an extensive Rolodex of people in the Ottawa area whom he entertains? Mr. Firth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, it has afforded us the luxury of having a large Rolodex of resources we can use and get them contracts within the federal government. Remaining very brief question to the Honourable Member from Saanich Gulf Islands. Mr. Firth, given the experience here and knowing that you have health challenges, all I can say is, aren't you ashamed? Mr. Firth. Mr. Speaker, do I have to answer that? Yes. Yes, yes you do. No, I am not ashamed. I think... It is my duty to inform the House that Mr. Firth's presence at the bar is no longer required and that the order is discharged. Il est mon devoir d'informer la 